Three more deaths and 78 new COVID-19 cases. The two t- t- soldiers who have been implicated in a drug smuggling ring and a daring gun attack on the police have been remanded. And at least one attorney is pleading with relatives to allow the courts to release mentally challenged inmates into their care. In international news, a powerful earthquake has struck off Turkey's Aegean coast and north of the Greek island of Samos, destroying a number of houses. And in sports, Jamaica's batting star Chris Gale achieves another cricket milestone as he fell one run short of a century in the IPL today. The details after the break. The two soldiers who've been implicated in a drug smuggling ring and a daring gun attack on the police have been remanded. The two JDF personnel, 39-year-old Rowan Mendes and 38-year-old Robert Smith, were remanded today when they appeared in the Santa Cruz Parish Court in St. Elizabeth. Both corporals are set to return to court on November 23. Then their attorneys are expected to make bail applications. The two JDF members have been charged with shooting with intent, illegal possession of firearm and dealing in ganja. They are also charged with taking steps to export ganja and possession of ganja. The soldiers were arrested two weeks ago in the gutters area of St. Elizabeth and 1,500 pounds of compressed ganja seized. The incident occurred at 9.30 p.m. Both soldiers reportedly engaged the police in a shootout prior to their arrests. Three people have died from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours in Jamaica. One death was previously under investigation. That's according to the Ministry of Health's latest COVID-19 clinical management summary. The death of an 86-year-old female from Clarendon that was being investigated by the Ministry of Health has been confirmed as a COVID-19-related death. The other deceased are an 83-year-old female from St. Catherine and a 41-year-old female from St. James. The ministry is also reporting 78 new COVID-19 cases in the latest test results over the last 24 hours. 642 samples were tested. This brings the total number of cases to 9,005. According to the Ministry of Health, majority of the cases are from Kingston and St. Andrew after recording 29 cases. This is followed by Westmoreland with 14 cases. St. Thomas, St. Elizabeth and Hanover recorded no new cases. The ministry says 13 more people have recovered, bringing recoveries to 4,442. In the meantime, 95 people are hospitalized, 14 are moderately ill and 3 are critical. Attorney at law, Isaac Buchanan, is pleading with relatives to allow the courts to release mentally challenged inmates into their care. Mr. Buchanan is collaborating with human rights lobby Stand Up for Jamaica to advocate for the release of a number of mentally ill inmates. But he says there are several mentally challenged persons now before the courts and judges' hands are tied because there are no relatives in whose care they can be released. He says those who have mentally challenged relatives in prisons should check up on them. Because you may very well be the catalyst that can allow the person to be released in a timely manner. I I myself am trying to assist persons and there is no family member so you must you must appreciate that it is now the alternative aspects of waiting for the ministry of health to identify our facilities these things are beautiful but it's not going to be in the near future and so the problem won't go away so it starts with the family members A committee of the court administration division has recommended an end to the practice of detaining mentally challenged inmates indefinitely. The division on the advice of the Chief Justice Brian Sykes had established a committee to assess the issue of lengthy detention of mentally challenged inmates deemed unfit to stand trial. The committee was established following the controversial story of a man, Noel Chambers, who died in prison after serving years without being allowed to stand trial. The committee also recommended a system where mentally challenged inmates are diverted from the courts. The point of diversion was the most salient point. We must move to immediately remove 
mentally ill persons from the institutions and that's certainly what stand up for jamaica and the country at large should be hoping for so the reaction is that it is a positive one and it's it's a positive step in the right direction and we hope that a lot of the recommendations can be put forth particularly the diversion aspect of it Mr. Buchanan is also hailing the committee's recommendation to adjust the testing mechanism used to determine whether mentally challenged inmates have the capacity to commit crimes for which they are accused. We are in a society where we do a lot of judging and a lot of assuming. And so it is not, it's, it's not just about um, being, being able to understand and like in, 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 just basic terms, people like said, you're bright or you can keep up. It's not just about the keeping up. It is about the capacity to be able to hear what's going on and to lean into your counsel and say, that's not how it go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you will appreciate that there are persons when they're mentally ill, they're, it's easy to suggest things to them. Isaac Buchanan, an attorney at law, speaking on Nationwide this morning. Meanwhile, Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice, JFJ, Rajay Malcolm, is in support of the proposed concept of establishing a mental health court. Conceptually, it's a good concept. However, the devil is always in the details. And so it's a paragraph in a very long report, just one paragraph. And so we would want to study something in detail and understand the how as opposed to just the what. However, the JFJ executive director is raising concerns about how the specialized court would work. If the mental health court ends up how many other specialized courts are in other jurisdictions where they end up being totally closed off, it's judge only, as this is being proposed here, and it's dominated by agencies and sort of a bureaucracy. Really much research into those jurisdictions now is showing that specialized closed courts end up being largely bureaucratic and mm shy away from their overall essence. But if they're organized in a way that in their organizing legislation and in their organizing um, policy documents create formal spaces for um, advocates and family members and social support, then it becomes a little bit easier. So it, it, it's really an issue of how, not so much what. He cited that similar concerns have been raised in relation to other specialized courts, such as the gun court or family court. He says the recommended mental health court will be more welcomed if it comes as part of broader law reforms in relation to the mentally challenged. Worthy of consideration if it comes in the context of law reform for mental health. So if we don't have a reform, the Mental Health Act, which the report itself recognizes, did not really change much from the archaic lunatic mm -hmm. Custody and Management Act, then we could have a court that is implementing a modern mm -hmm. mental health act. But if you don't change the actual architecture mm -hmm. for mental health management, then the court is likely to reproduce the problems of that system. And that's why it would be part of a reform of mental health management generally from a human rights-based perspective. Mr. Malcolm says part of that law reform should be to restrict the ability of the court to detain persons in correctional facilities indefinitely. Parliament's intention with the law has never been to lock people away in prison. Instead, it has been to treat persons. Mm -hmm. But the system has not provided proper opportunities for treatment. And so one way that we fix that um, is actually preventing and restricting the continuation of diverting persons into the criminal system and instead creating more pathways for diverting them into the therapeutic system. But that itself, folks, also requires investment mm. in mental health service provision in the country. And mm. so it's it's quite a complicated question. And that's why I call it a very good start. Mm -hmm. But in order to do it, we have to do a whole lot more. Roger Malcolm, Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice, speaking on Nationwide this morning. In the meantime, Mr. Malcolm says an accountability structure is one of the primary recommendations missing from what the Court Administrative Division's Mental Health Inquiry Committee has proposed. Without those things, without somebody exercising ownership of it, mm -hmm. the report cited several other reports that came to very exactly. similar conclusions exactly. that were sitting on shelves. Yes. And, and so, yeah, and one thing I would really say is that is missing is an accountability structure to bring it to action. Otherwise, you may actually be here in 10 years. Roger Malcolm, Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice. 
Education Minister Favel Williams is urging parents to lead by example and be supportive to their children as they navigate the world. Minister Williams was delivering the keynote address at the media launch of the National Parenting Support Commission's Parents Month. National Parent Month is being observed under the theme Father Rise, Lead and Be Wise. A parent's personal example is one of the best tools for conveying good values and attitudes. Children who see their parents displaying honesty, integrity, diligence, and conviction are more likely to adopt those values in their own lives as they nurture, as they mature into teens and adults. In addition, children and teenagers especially need their parents to be their biggest cheerleaders as they navigate their way through schools. She notes that parents may not always agree with their children, especially as they grow older and seek their own independence. But Minister Williams says parents must be tolerant and respectful to their children so those children can learn to be tolerant and respect others. We are all being challenged to establish meaningful relationships with our children. I must therefore congratulate the NPSC for its continued focus on providing support to parents. This year's observations also come against the background of the COVID-19 crisis and the need for more home-based support in educating our children. Despite the challenge, it's a great opportunity for bonding, for spending time together, to share values and be supportive of our children especially our boys. Favel Williams, Education Minister, addressing the media launch of the National Parenting Support Commission's Parents Month. Now, opposition spokesperson on education, Dr. Angela Brown-Burke, is calling for more consultation and transparency on the government's pilot project for the phased resumption of face-to-face -face classes. Dr. Brown-Burke says she has no difficulty with resuming in-person classes, but she says there needs, there's need for more dialogue. I actually have no difficulty with contemplation of a face-to-face -face, um, interaction for schools. What I really am disappointed with is how we are doing it. So the first thing is, I have been saying ever since I started that we need dialogue. The Education Ministry says it, it's utilized the services of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute to assess all schools to determine which can reopen safely. And the Ministry says it's held extensive consultations with the stakeholders to share the data. But according to Dr. Brown Burke, it's not good enough for the government to say they've assessed all the schools. We need a conversation with the schools. Everywhere else in the world, when we are opening up whether it's schools or whether it's industries, you actually have a very transparent set of matrix that say, under these conditions, we will resume economic activities or under these conditions, we will open school. I don't believe that we should take comfort at all. With the government saying that they have used uh, some criteria that depends on the level of spread of COVID in the area. No. Let us know what are you using as that barometer. The opposition spokeswoman on education says based on her talks with administrators, she has been advised that fewer than 30% of their students are accessing online classes. I have spoken to principals who actually cannot tell you that more than 30% of their student population is actively engaged in any teaching learning exercise. It is dire, and I believe, listen, the the risks associated with face to face learning, they have not disappeared. We have been saying we have to learn to live with COVID. What does that really mean? Does that mean that you're going to help me to access online learning? Dr. Angela Brown Burke, opposition spokeswoman on education, speaking yesterday with Nationwide News. Overseas now, a powerful earthquake has struck off Turkey's Aegean coast and north of the Greek island of Samos, destroying a number of houses. The U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, said the 7.0 magnitude tremor was centered off Turkey's Izmir province. Turkey put the magnitude lower at 6.6, .6, saying six people had died and 202 were injured in the city of Izmir. On Samos, two teenagers were killed. 
the shallow tremor triggered a mini tsunami that flooded Izmir and Samos. The USGS said the quake, which was felt as far away as Athens and Istanbul, struck at a depth of 10 kilometers, although Turkish officials said it was 16 kilometers below ground. Turkey and Greece both sit on fault lines and earthquakes are common. In Izmir, Turkey's third largest city with a population of nearly 3 million, many people were seen running out of, into the streets in panic and fear after the quake struck. At least 20 buildings collapsed. And that's the news. Sports is next.